I think we get uh, started. Yes. Um, welcome to, uh, to to everyone, and especially to Professor Luke Van Langenhoven. It's his first time in in Melbourne, but not his first time in Australia. Um, this is uh, an event co-hosted by the Monash Rabinowitz Center, the Nikola Zarev Center for Ukrainian Studies, and we have uh, the, the president right here, Marco Pavlici, and also the School of Social Sciences of uh, Monash University. So Professor Luke van Langenhove is the director of the Comparative Ritual Integration Studies Institute of the United Nations University in a beautiful spot on the planet called Bruges in Belgium. Uh, prior to this, he was Deputy Secretary General of the Belgian Federal Ministry of Science Policy, Deputy Chief of Cabinet of the Belgian Federal Minister of Science Policy, and a researcher and lecturer at the Free University of Brussels, the From 2006 to 2010, he was Vice President of the International Social Sciences Council, and he currently teaches at the UB, the UNB, and the College of Europe, which is also in Bruges, which is what I just mentioned. Now, Professor Lord Van Langenhoven has published widely on mutual integration, social science theory, positioning theory, and psychology. Uh, he has attracted a very, very large following in positioning theory, for example. So that's another side of, of um, you know, uh, his uh, impressive career here. Um, and today he's going to talk about the United Nations and the European Union in historical and contemporary perspectives, what contribution to peace and security. And I think it's very, very topical. And uh, as you will see, it has something to do with, with Ukraine uh, as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Pascal, for the nice welcome words and also for inviting me here. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm indeed affiliated to the United Nations University, which is a kind of decentralized think tank that operates within the UN system. So basically, I'm at this point the UN civil servant. So I have to be careful what I say, it's not politically incorrect. But, but the thing is interesting when um, my colleagues in New York or in Geneva, who are part of the UN system, want to publish something, they have to go up the hierarchy want permission to publish what they have to say. We at the United Nations University, we don't have to do that. We have a kind of academic freedom that allows us to tell whatever. So I can also be very critical of my own organization, the uh, United Nations. The title of, of my uh, talk today, it, it's really it's a work in progress, and the title is the UN and the EU in historical contemporary perspectives. What contribution to peace and security is perhaps not the most sexy title that I could be done. I'm sorry for that. Um, but um, I will hopefully try to show you that there is something going on that for the future of global governance in the world can be uh, quite interesting at least. Um, but first let me tell you something about what I'm not going to talk about. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk about theories of international relations or anything like that, not at all. Or to some of you know I'm not quite fond of theories, and I even believe that at the end of the day it is not only as practical as a good theory, but so no theory today. Uh, I will neither speak about any specific case studies or things that are going on, actually maybe with a bit exception for later on in Ukraine, but we will see about that. So no theory on the one hand, no cases on the other hand. What remains, what remains is, is history. I would like to talk about the whole issue of the dream and also a little bit of the practice of multilateralism because multilateralism, multilateralism has always been a dream for certain people, for certain persons and I want to bring in that historical perspective and the point I want to make with the, to the history of both the United Nations as a multilateral organization on the one hand and the EU as a multilateral organization on the other hand. The point I want to make is that today uh, there is a kind of window of opportunity to have a world with more peace and a more secure world if the UN and the EU, and for that matter not only the EU but also other regional organizations, could find a way to collaborate more. So it's about the future that I'm going to speak also, but first we start a little bit with the history. 
And we go back to the end of the Second World War. I don't need to go into detail, everybody knows that part of history. But what is remarkable is that in the years 1945 and 1947, two major governance innovations occurred that in a way have really shaped the world since then. First of all, at the global level, left side of the power point, we have the creation of a set of new institutions for political on the one hand and economic on the other hand governance that have been established. The United Nations, the world, Geneva, everybody knows it, but also so-called Bretton Woods institutions, which is the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, the World Bank, and what is now called the World Trade Organization. That's at the global level. And I will come back to that in a moment. But meanwhile, at exactly the same period, we see that at the European level, there was this dream for a multilateral organization of Europe, and even the dream for a united Europe that became institutionalized with, first of all, the European coal and steel community, which is one of the forerunners, or the major forerunners, of what is now labeled as the European Union. So the UN and the EU were two independent realms of multilateral governments, multilateral in the sense that you bring a number of sovereign states together and you create a space where they can talk to each other and where at the end of the day they can even do things better together. So they are two independent realms, but the interesting point I think, or the interesting issue is, that the visions behind the creation of these organizations, one, the United Nations, and the other, that's called for the time being the United Europe, that they were influenced by the same dreams, by the same historical events, and they were rooted in a kind of deep desire for sustainable peace in the world. However, immediately afterwards, let's say from 1946 <coughs> onwards, something happened that shook the world, that was the beginning of the Cold War. And as a result of that, Cold War, the world became very bipolar, bipolarly organized, the United States and allies on the other one hand, and the Soviet Union and allies on the other hand. And the point I want to make today is that as a result of that bipolar world, a kind of association or cooperation between the UN on the one hand and the EU on the other hand was actually not possible. And there has been a kind of tension between the global region on the one hand things that we call today regional governance. That tension goes actually back to the time when the United Nations were created. So Second World War, let's go 45. In 45, the war, the war was still going on. The Allies were already thinking of how to construct institutions for afterwards that would make it impossible hopefully impossible that such atrocities as the First and the Second World War would happen. Remember that at the time of the Second World War we had the League of Nations, which was defunct and did a lot of good things as well, but basically it didn't function. It was not, uh, it was not ready uh, to prevent the world wars. So we had in San Francisco, 45, a number of very important meetings where the Allies, diplomats, that, and they were discussing a new global architecture for peace and security. And basically at that moment, there were two models at the table. One model was to create a global security council with the idea that wherever on the planet there is a conflict, that conflict should be in diplomatic terms be dealt with at that level of the global security council, and then action should be taken up to it. But there was also another model and that model was to work with a number of regional security councils, one for the Americas, one for Asia, one for Africa, etc., etc. And the diplomats and even the head of states were truly divided on, on that topic, and uh, positions also shifted from one to the other. The Belgians, for instance, and the Belgians were always very much in favor of the regional security councils, uh, but uh, the United States, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, was particularly strong on the issue that there should be a global security council and not a regional council. It's an interesting exercise, historical exercise, to find out why exactly some countries were supporting the regional uh, organizational level and others at the global level. One very outstanding uh, 
uh, person in this with outstanding views was British Prime Minister then, Winston Churchill, who was really championing the creation of regional security councils. In his case, by the way, he spoke always of a regional security council for the Americas, one for Asia, one for Africa, one for Europe, and one for the United Kingdom. Tells you something maybe about his wishes. Uh, anyway. Um, nevertheless, Churchill didn't win that diplomatic battle. At the end of the day, the United Nations, as everybody knows, chose to be organized in a global way with one Security Council. This is the situation until today. Uh, but here are some extracts from the speech that Churchill gave in '46, because he even if he lost that diplomatic battle in San Francisco, he kept on dreaming from a United States of Europe on the one hand, and a relationship between that kind of regional entity and the uh, global entity. So we have, for instance, here, I think it's a very nice quote, there is no reason why a regional organization in Europe should in any way conflict with the world organization of the United Nations economists. The way he, he writes is the, as the way he speaks, and then you have to imagine a big cigar on top of it. On the contrary, I believe that the larger synthesis will always survive if it's part of the one coherent national politics, etc., etc. And it goes on. Our constant aim must be to build and fortify the strength of the United Nations organization. Under and within that world concept, we must recreate the European family in the regional structure, the United States of Europe. Today, this sounds very impossible for politicians and even the people of Europe that some people have a dream of the creation of the United States of Europe. Federalism is uh, sometimes in, in, in the literature of international relations called the F word, but nobody really tries to, uh, to mention. Um, but of course, that kind of dreams existed, and by the way, it still exists. Uh, I think two, three years ago, the, the former Prime Minister of Belgium, Guy Verhofstadt, wrote a little booklet uh, with exactly that title, the United States of, of Europe, and now he's running for become a commissioner or president of the council, we will see if that kind of uh, very militant ideas even make a chance. I, this is recorded, I was about to say that, but if I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, grand ideas at the end of the Second World War. But then, a couple of things occurred that determined and really changed the fate of these grand ideas. First of all, there was the dire straits in which Europe found itself after the Second World War. We have, no, we have no idea today how bad the situation was. Millions of people had no houses, were transported from one place to the other. There was no infrastructure, there was shortage of food, there was shortage of capital, there was shortage of and everything. And basically, what Europe then needed was fresh money. And that is where the Americans came in and said, okay, we are going to give you that fresh money, an influx, influx of dollars. Uh, as everybody knows, the famous Marshall Plan that uh, was uh, adopted in June 1947 uh, that supported the European reconstruction. The interesting thing about the Marshall Plan is that there was one paragraph, one section in it that said, yes, you will have to organize the reconstruction yourself. And what we want to see from the United States perspective is that you do it in an integrated way. So basically, the idea to create a United States of Europe or something like was <coughs> stimulated by the very fact of the Marshall Plan, which is sometimes forgotten in the literature today, but it's an interesting part. But something else happened at the same moment, the birth of the Cold War, as I already mentioned. The world and Europe entered into a bipolar Cold War era. And in a way, alarmed by the Soviet Union intention to expand its influence, its communist influence in Eastern Europe, in Asia and Africa, in European countries. I mean, some of the European countries, such as Greece, for instance, has been, has been uh, delicate balance between will it move towards the Eastern Bloc or will it move towards the Western Bloc. And the response of the United States at that moment was the so-called containment policy to try to limit the expansion of the Soviet Union to uh, as less countries as possible. So the idea to create a united Europe with on the one hand capitalist countries and on the 
the other hand, uh, communist states was impossible. So Churchill and many others had to rethink their original dream, and instead of dreaming of a united Europe, they started dreaming of a united Western Europe. 1948, we had the famous Congress of Europe that was organized in The Hague. Churchill was not any longer prime minister then because, as we all say, he won the war and he lost the elections, but many other intellectuals and politicians were there. And they were addressing this vision of Europe. And at that moment, about 15 or 16, I believe, West European states were already associated for economic purposes, <coughs> driven by the Marshall Plan, and had entered into close economic and military relationships. And allow me as a Belgian and invited by another Belgian uh, to say something about Belgium. Belgium played a very important role in that by starting to work very intensively together with its two neighboring countries, uh, the Netherlands on the one hand and Luxembourg on the other hand, and they started what is now called the Benelux, one of the first regional organizations that was a kind of laboratory for the European integration project uh, later on. That happy novel term as Churchill uh, qualified uh, the Benelux. And once again at that conference, he, uh, I already mentioned this, he had, he talked about this dream, nothing, and, and the interesting thing here is that always he stresses the relationship between United Europe on the one hand and the United World on the other hand. So he said, nothing that we do or plan here conflicts with the authority of the World Organization of the United Nations. On the contrary, I always believe, as I did in the war, that the Council of Europe was a subordinate but necessary part of the world organization. So, and this is not Churchill, but you, there are many other sources that I, I could quote that had this idea that the best way to make sure that conflicts do not escalate in world wars is to try to contain them or to combat them, if you want, them, at the regional level. Why? Because the intuition tells you that it's better to, to deal with problems and conflicts at the region level so that the people involved in it can try to solve their own cases. And if that doesn't work, then you go, you go to higher appeal, so to speak, to the global uh, Let's now, for a moment, turn away from, from Europe and, and Churchill to the uh, UN. There was, the, again, as I mentioned, the debates in San Francisco, the diplomats favoring uh, the Global Security Council, which is now called the Security Council of Kuhn, one of the regions. But there is something that remains from that debate, as is often the case when diplomats come together and they start looking for the compromise. And for that, you have to read something, a little booklet that is really worth reading. It is the Charter of the United Nations. It's a very thin booklet with a couple of chapters. So I believe if I'm not mistaken. And one of the chapters is chapter 8. And chapter 8 is about cooperation between the United Nations and the regional organizations. So the people who crafted the architecture of global governance after the Second World War had in mind that it should be done in such a way that the United Nations would cooperate with the regional organizations. This was extraordinary. And you know why? Because at that moment, hardly any regional organizations existed. There was indeed the Benelux that you just mentioned, small, three, three, very small part of Europe, and there was the League of Arab States. And those were the only two existing regional organizations. So it was quite visionary at that moment to think about this cooperation. Um, so the Charter of the UN allows cooperation with regional organizations. But what we have seen later on is that nothing much happened for many years. Why? Well, probably not. Probably, surely, as a result of that same Cold War that prevented regional organizations to develop their own independent status, that everything that was happening was immediately seen in terms of East to West conflict, etc. etc. So within the framework of the United Nations, there was no place for regional organizations at that moment. Nevertheless, what happened outside the United Nations between 1945 and now is a proliferation of regional organizations worldwide. 
most of them are dealing with economic issues, with trade issues, they take the form of free trade or regional trade uh, agreements. Some of them take also on board security issues or any other topical things like managing water lessons or whatever. So nowadays we have about, it depends on how you count it, it's under 200 or 300 regional organizations worldwide. And it's still uh, booming the number of regional organizations. So we have today a totally new uh, situation. So 45, chapter 8, that gives a framework for relations between the UN and regional organizations and peace and security issues. And then nothing much happened until the end of the Cold War. And we see in 1992, the um, UN Secretary General, Gutus Gutus Ghali, was mandated by the Security Council to write a report on the future of the UN, which is called an Agenda for Peace. And in that report, he said that, and I quote, there is a new era of opportunity. Is that better? Okay. Next. It's maybe because it's uh, not charged, huh? Is it better? Good. I don't know what I did, but it's better. Um, so, Butus Butus Gale, Butus Butus Gale and the Gender for Peace spoke about, and I quote again, a new era of opportunity for regional arrangements or agencies that can render great service to the United Nations. So, there was this renewed idea of working together, regional organizations and the UN. What happened in the following years, 1994 to 2006, uh, Kofi Annan, um, convened several so-called high-level meetings between the UN and the heads of regional organizations, which was a very interesting thing. And as director of the UN Chris, I have been uh, able to, to assist to some of these high-level meetings and prepare some of these high-level meetings. And what we saw was that there was indeed really a willingness of most of the regional organizations to work under the umbrella of the United Nations. But as we will see later on, a number of things happened that made that very difficult. And as a matter of fact, after 2006, the whole idea of high level uh, meetings was dropped. And it took a look, couple of years before Ban Ki Moon, the, the present Secretary General, I was, uh, took really a firm interest in these issues again, and with a focus, a focus on collaboration between the UN and one specific regional organization, that is the African Union. And now in recent years, uh, there is a new initiative which is called the Retreats, where the heads of top diplomats of regional organizations come together for, let's say, a long weekend somewhere in Europe to uh, have discussions, uh, very open discussions between themselves and the uh, UN. And meanwhile, on several occasions, the US Security Council has expressed in resolutions uh, the fact that there should indeed be a growing coordination and even cooperation between the UN and regional organizations. The first resolution for those interested in resolution was resolution 1631 uh, on the cooperation between the UN and regional uh, organizations. So we see a very slow development of multilateralism working together with regional organizations. And it would immediately make a critique of that and say, well, isn't this all too slow? Isn't this, you know, to Diplomats world with a lot of talks and papers and, and resolutions. And meanwhile, the world continues at a very rapid pace, definitely. But the point is that all of this, the, the, the evolution in Europe, and I'll come back to that later on, on the one hand, the evolution at the multilateral global UN level, is taking place in a world that is, in, in my view, dominated by stakes. The world of states, international relations, is a game primarily of states. And it is very difficult for non-state actors, such as the UN International Organization, or such as the EU or the African Union or the Arab States, to enter that playing field. Because at the end of the day, these organizations are considered as well, actors to a certain extent, yes, but not real actors, as realists uh, would say not real active because only states can be in that uh, position. So a number of observations can be. There is a growth in population and in, at least in, in, sorry, in 
talking about cooperation since 1945, but the formalized aspects of that are still very little. Here would be a good moment, but I will not do that, to, to show in detail that there are a number of cooperation agreements and coordination agreements between the EU and the UN, but that you can easily find on Google or the web or ask Pascal Lindt, who is more expert on those things than, than I am. Uh, so I, I will stick to the grant uh, scheme. We also see that the Secretary General and the Security Council have been acting as main drivers to, to call for please, let's have more collaboration between the regional organizations and the UN, with states in a double position sometimes, or on the one hand, there's a lot of lip service that say, oh yes, yes, we should all collaborate, thank you very much, but at the end of the day, when it boils down to really doing things, it becomes more uh, problematic. And then there is something else, that is that the regional integration projects that we have been seeing proliferating all over the world are of a very diverse nature. On the one hand, on one hand of the extreme, you have something like the European Union, with a very deep political integration, sometimes a pooling of sovereignty, uh, with its own uh, judicial system, uh, a lot of rules and stuff like that. On the other hand, you have very loosely organized forms of regional organization. Some of them are nothing much more than just a couple of pieces of paper with, with grants, declarations that have been signed by Arab states, and then nothing much happens with it. On top of it, Regional organizations are, unlike states, nicely laying next to each other on the map. And if you take a world map, you can see all the states, and there's no overlap between the states, by definition, I would say. If, because if that isn't a problem, then you have a real problem and a conflict. Um, but regional organizations come in all kinds of sizes, and they overlap. Some scholars therefore talk about the spaghetti ball of regional grade. Take a map of Africa and look to the number of countries that are member of different regional organizations at the same time is overwhelming. And also in Europe, everybody speaks about the EU, but Europe is not the same as the EU. You also have the Council of Europe, uh, you have the Benelux, you have other free trade agreements. So there is this complex game of regional organizations, which, which a complex scheme of regional organizations, which makes it very difficult to operate within the UN, because in the UN, Classical question would then be who speaks on behalf of Europe? And then people from the EU would say, well, we, but then the council people would say, well, maybe we are better in a better position because we have more member states, etc., etc. So there are a lot of problems. The diversity in mandates, purposes, capacity, budgets, and stuff. Which was, by the way, one of the problems of those high level meetings that I mentioned, that at the end of the day, after the fourth or the fifth high level meeting, everybody wanted to. Become a member and have this uh, close mm -hmm. encounters with the Secretary General. So we saw institutions, honorable institutions, that's the point, like uh, such as uh, Interpol, saying, ah, we also want to be part of it. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Interpol, uh, with all due respect, is not a regional mm -hmm. And how did the UN respond to that? They, they found it very difficult to, to change the focus, so they changed the name and said, okay, we, we call it the high level meeting between the UN and the regional and other people national organizations, so they could accommodate even more uh, of these organizations. Anyway, so, uh, the story I've been giving so far is a story about regional organizations where the UN and intellectuals, politicians, have good hopes that they can contribute to solving regional security problems. But there is another story to tell, and I go, go very quickly to this one. Uh, the other story is that you could do the same thing for economic, social economic aspects. And indeed, in chapter 10 of the charter, there is talk about creating an economic and social council, ECOSOC, that has been done. Then ECOSOC itself has de devolved its function in a number of regional economic commissions. The first one, that was established in 1947, the Economic Commission for Europe, that was linked to the reconstruction uh, ideas, to others to follow, etc., etc. I'm not going to go much into details here, but we have now a number of economic commissions operating within the 
UN, so there are not regional organizations outside the UN that exist within the UN, and they are doing quite some interesting uh, work at this moment. So from an academic point, you could then say, well, maybe in the future we have to see if it will be possible to link these UN economic commissions or regional organizations within the UN to the regional organizations outside the UN. At this moment, nothing concrete is happening in that direction, but it is one of the ideas that, uh, for instance, with our research center in Bruges, we want to put on the table. The point is that we think it is possible to demonstrate that regional governments is not incompatible with the global aspirations of the UN. Because that is for some people still debated and said, we don't believe in it, regional solutions uh, that will create a kind of uh, multipolar world where the region, I mean, the whole idea that pops up of George Orwell's 1984, where you have shifting region blocks that form alliances and that fight against each other. That is, of course, not the basic idea about regional governance. The idea is that you say, let's apply a kind of subsidiarity principle that first we try to settle the conflict between states or interstate conflict at as low as possible level, lowest level as possible, which is then the region. If that doesn't work, or is, if any of the parties involved says, well, we can't do it at the region level because one of us is, let's say, the hegemon and it's, it's way too big for us, the others for whatever reason, then you can go to the global level. That's basically uh, the idea. So I believe, indeed, that there is potential for regional agreements to contribute to the purposes of the UN in the fields of peace and security on the one hand, but also in the fields of economic and social affairs on the other hand. So all of this to say that at this moment we have worldwide one regional organization that is really very well developed. Obviously, it is you can make a critique of everything, so you can also and you should make a critique of the EU, that, that's not the point. But what I want to make is to say that there are infrastructure, there are rules, there are institutions, no other regional organization is as developed at this moment as the EU. Does this mean that the EU is a model for the rest of the world? Not necessarily. I would even say obviously not. Uh, but of course, because some things exist, means that they can be a source of inspiration for others, for others to use our limit even to copy. So I don't think it should be the, the, the purpose of the EU to become the model for the rest of the world. But on the other hand, it's good that the rest of the world looks to uh, the things that work well and the things that don't work well. At the level. I can give you just one example. Uh, one of the, the innovations in, in terms of governance with the EU has been the creation of a commission which has a fantastic French acronym, the Colibert. And the Colibert or the Commission of Permanent Representatives. It means that when these states come together, they not only do it at the level of heads of states or ministers involved or whatever, but they do it on a permanent basis. You have kind of ambassadors, diplomats of the different states that reside permanently in Brussels, and they meet each other on a permanent basis. And they prepare the resolutions, the drafts, the texts that then have to be decided by the ministers in the European Council. And that opens the way for very, well, more smooth operation, more in-depth dealing of dossiers than uh, annual or biannual or six monthly meetings between uh, different ministers. This has been used for many years now at the level of the EU. It seems to give quite a lot of positive results. So it is only normal that um, other regional organizations, such as ASEAN at some point, looks to the EU and say, hey, you have an interesting thing they're going on, so let's do the same, let's copy it. And indeed, at this moment, since a couple of years, ASEAN has its own kind of commentary. Uh, but again, this is not to say that the EU should have this ambition to be a model for the rest of the world. Because, on the one hand, you can talk about the EU in terms of success stories, all the things that have been realized. But on the other hand, there are a number of things that have not been realized and that are not even functioning very well at this level. So it's also possible for the 
very critical. And one of the classical critical issues is the complexity of the process, of course. The way uh, to come to compromises between these many now 28 member states makes it or drives the, the, the decision making processes in the direction of becoming very opaque and complex. And, and sometimes even people who take the decisions have difficulties in understanding. Uh, as is said to have mentioned one time, that uh, the integration process in Europe is going forward by stealth, meaning that it's the people from the Commission that prepare very difficult things, and that the diplomats then have to late in the evening or in the middle of the night come to a decision and that the day after they wake up and say, oh my god, what did we have decided that it's too late? And those touches. Anyway, in terms of global governance, what we see is that in the beginning of the UP project, that project was, I would say by definition, inward looking. The idea was to rescue Europe, to make it possible that there would be another war in Europe. Here. The, the whole thinking of people like Jean Monnet, Schumann, Spinelli, and many others was that the only way to prevent France and Germany in particular to fight with each other was to make sure that their economies are really integrated. So that, in a sense, if one would attack the other, it would be the same as attacking yourself. At that moment, just after the, uh, yeah, after the Second World War, one of the big two industrial sectors at that moment were the steel, the production of steel, and the production of uh, coal in coal mines. So that is why the European project started with an integration of those two industries, especially the integration of the French and German uh, steel and coal production. And but, so the, 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 the means they organized was economic integration, but the purpose was security. It was the idea was to integrate Europe so that war would be impossible in the future. Gradually, this project became expanded in the sense that a new target became not only secure internal security, but also being able to defend the, let's say, the interests of the European industry at the world scale. Originally, there was talk about the triad, which was the US, Japan, and the EU, and how the EU could be competitive vis a vis those two main competitors, uh, the US and, and Japan. Now, this has evolved in global competitiveness, also vis a vis BRICS and uh, all the stuff. <coughs> and meanwhile, the European <coughs> Union also took upon this ambition, dream if you want, to become a little bit recognized as a global actor only as a regional actor, but also as a global actor. Hence the idea to work on peacekeeping missions uh, to say that, yes, it's not France or Germany or UK or whatever that is willing to work on behalf of the UN, but the UN can turn to the EU and can uh, make use of forces made available and resources made available by the EU. So the effect of on the field, what you see is that indeed there is a growing coordination between the UN and the EU. And the EU has always, as ever since then, I'm talking about the 60s, 70s, been a very firm funder of development aid through the United Nations. At this moment, the EU, meaning the EU, the European budget, plus the budget of the United States together, if you take it together, is the main funding source for the United Nations. Which also explains why, uh, since a couple of years, a lot of UN agencies have um, agencies, uh, offices, sorry, offices in Brussels. So we have what we know, New York, Geneva, etc. But there is a growing UN com uh, community in Brussels as well that is in permanent relations with the EU. This allows me to say something about the budget of the UN. Since the end of the Cold War, the tasks that the UN has to deal with have grown enormously. There is a demand that wherever on the planet, if there is a security issue, the UN should be there and should be able to fix it. And people don't like states doing things outside of 
in the nature. But on top of it, the mission of the UN has also been broadening to the extent that other issues, such as climate change, uh, HIV, uh, HIV uh, viruses, uh, a lot of other things are also on the agenda of the United Nations. So the tasks confronted with are enormous, but is this reflected in the resources that the states give to the United Nations? Not at all. I've been told, I'm not 100% sure to what extent it's correct, but I've been told that the budget of the final gate in New York is bigger than the budget of the whole United Nations. And for sure, other people told me that the budget of NASA, the space organization of the US, is much richer than the UN ever can dream of. And of course, it is important that we have been able to send people and that in the future they will be sent to Mars or whatever. But the question is where are the priorities and, and why are we willing to invest that much money in uh, space uh, projects and not in creating a uh, more secure, more sustainable world. Anyway, all of this to say the context in which the EU is more and more active as a uh, global, or at least has the ambition to be active as a global actor. That was uh, very clear in 2009 Lisbon Treaty, where they, on the one hand, go for a much more internal, cohesive Europe, with all the problems related to that, but on the other hand, on the, hand, the, on the other hand, they also want to strengthen the external visibility and the global relevance of the EU, mainly by creating new posts, such as the permanent president of the European Council, other Belgium, not well known here in history, but he plays a very important role at this very moment. And there is the so-called high representative at the foreign affairs and security policy. This is, let's say, put in a very positive way. You can also look at it from a different perspective and say it has taken ages before you will be saw the, the high representative will be saw. The high representative for foreign affairs and security policy has been appointed. And not, well, that went relatively quickly. But the main problem is that then the creation of the external action service, a kind of diplomatic force for the EU, that has taken really a very long period. And it's still somehow not decided yet how it's going to function and what its role will be or is vis a vis the national diplomatic force. So there's a lot of institutional complexity here yeah, that makes an efficient function of these structures not very uh, obvious. And we've seen this in, in recent crisis with Ukraine, but at some point it's in the presence of the European Council, who is there, who goes to Kiev, then it's uh, Mrs. Mrs. Ashton, the uh, high representative, then it's Mrs. Merkel who's on the field trip doing something. And, and you see, if you just follow the press, the lack of coherence that there is in but some progress is made step by step, and again, this goes very slowly. And what we see, if we now go back to the UN level, that is that the EU is also more and more active within the UN. I already mentioned financial contribution, but there is also the fact that the EU was granted observer status in it already in 1974 to the General Assembly of the United Nations. Observer status means that you can attend the meetings, you get the papers, and for the rest, you should be happy, you do not intervene. Which makes sense because the UN, should I remember it, is a group of states, not of multilateral organizations, not of non-state actors. It's state, you have to be a state to become a member of the but they allowed the EU to be there uh, as an observer state, which was taken on very positively by the EU by very all kinds of diplomatic relations between, because the UN itself is a very big, complex house with all the different agencies. And the, UN, and the EU has shown there that it has a real interest in multilateralism, and it coined for itself, and it is this uh, concept of effective multilateralism, multilateralism as a guiding line for its own policy. In 2011, the EU was even granted so-called enhanced observer status, which means that you cannot only attend the meetings, 
which you can also speak. And this is really wow. This is the first time that this happens, that a non-state actor has now the right to speak in the general assembly. But on that said, this is an important recognition as for the EU, we go back to it. However, this has been a very difficult uh, issue. Because when a number of European member states tabled that uh, General Assembly resolution, there was quite a lot of opposition within the GA. Why? Because the EU, the EU was talking only about itself, not about the other regional organizations. And indeed, there was opposition, and some uh, countries, uh, the Caribbean community, the African group, the Pacific Island, Venezuela, Iran, and many others, said, no, we don't want this. We don't want to vote for the revolution that only looks to Europe. This is so Western Eurocentric. We need something that is uh, inclusive for all the regional organizations. So they had to do the whole work, and it was only by the second meeting, uh, a couple of months later, that indeed the resolution passed. And now the resolution, uh, and I quote, recognizes that following a request on behalf of a regional organization uh, that has observed status in the General Assembly, and of whose member states have agreed agreements that allow the organization representative to speak on behalf of the organization and its member state, then the assembly may adopt modalities for the participation of the regional organizations. It sounds very technical and stuff like that. Or nevertheless, this is of really great importance because it, it changes the very nature of the United Nations from an organization with states as only member states to potentially an organization where you have states and not state actors, regional organizations as Which brings us back to 1945, to the charter that was already then uh, opening up in that direction. Uh, so this resolution has raised, I think, also high expectations on the role that the EU will play as a promoter of such rights for other regional organizations. And I have to say, until now, I don't see a lot of that willingness of the EU to say to the other regional organizations, come on, let's do things together, let's work together. By the way, there is a possibility within the UN uh, to be recognized as what we call a Chapter 8 organization, which gives you right, to, to, to certain information between part of some uh, meetings and stuff like that. And the League of Arab States is a Chapter 8 region. EU not. And I tried to figure out at one point uh, by talking to representatives of the EU, and the thing is, I didn't, man I didn't manage to find an official invitation, but off the record, some people told me, well, this is because we don't want to be seen at the same level of the African Union. We, the EU, we are something different. You cannot put us in the same category as African Union, League of Arab States, Shanghai Corporation, which is a very interesting point of view to put it in uh, as neutral as possible terms. Uh, I can uh, but the point is, granting the EU speaking rights at the General Assembly has opened the door for other regional organizations to request such a status. Okay. I also want to say that notwithstanding the initial protests of some groupings of countries until now, uh, to my knowledge, maybe I'm not up to date, but to my knowledge, none, no other regional organization has so far requested that upgrade of its status, which is interesting in itself uh, as well. Um, all of this res resonates also with what's happening within Europe. I refer to the European Parliament, where its Committee on Foreign Affairs and the European Parliament of institutions, and it's a very respectable institution, which since the, the, the Lisbon Treaty has more powers uh, ever. And uh, they uh, adopted a resolution which says the following thing. Uh, it, the, the resolution is that the EU is a global actor, it's role in multilateral organizations, and in that resolution you can read that an EU seat, EU seat in an enlarged security council, remains a central long-term goal of the this is even more revolutionary against what's going on in the General Assembly because you can say at the end of the day, 
general assembly is let's be honest, talking short take resolutions or whatever things, but the really important issues come before the Security Council, interactions with its vetoes and stuff like that. We have two European countries, permanent members of that uh, council, the United Kingdom and France. What are the chances that these uh, uh, states will give up their privileged position and go for a new seat at this moment close to zero? Yeah? I would call it social science fiction or something like that. Uh, but it's not the first time in history that when things seem impossible at one time, that they become possible at another time. And it is, I think, a very interesting issue that we have this resolution taken by the uh, European uh, Parliament. Talking a lot about General Assembly, Security Council now, and all these things, but the world of multilateral organizations is much bigger in this paper, which I will not explain in detail, you can find an overview of the representation of the EU in many different agencies, programs, organizations, also the G8 and G20, uh, where in some cases the EU is indeed fully fledged present. Basically, we see that organizations that are intended to be organizations of states have now EU as full fledged members. Is the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, the WTO, and then the G8 and the G20. So they demonstrate that permanent membership of a regional organization in international global organizations is not really a utopia, nor is it a new idea. So the EU is an actor. It can have, by the things that it's doing, also the role of a model. And it should possibly, in my view, also sometimes take on the role as a facilitator as trying to help the other organizations, especially when we talk about regional organizations at the level of developing uh, countries. So there are a couple of things that, that are still possible in the future, but maybe we can uh, discuss about it uh, later. So this is a long-term development. As I said, I don't want to theorize a lot about it, and I don't want to go into details about ongoing peacekeeping missions that have been run by EU for the UN and stuff like that involved on the sometimes difficult division of labor between NATO, the UN, the EU and stuff like that. It's all very interesting and technical. I just wanted to give you the, the overall historical development since 45 to now, where I think at this moment we are at a moment where there is indeed a window of opportunity uh, for increased cooperation and regional organizations in general. And you can see this, um, I think I have to skip this, yeah. um, by some quotes. The first quote is from Maki Moon, and we talk in 6th of August 2013, so about a year ago. The architects of the United Nations Charter were visionary in foreseeing a world where the 193 nations, body and regional organizations work together. Visionary. Indeed, I think he puts it right as well that uh, it's amazing how the UN Charter has actually been foreseeing the world in which we live today. But then he adds, we, it's, they likely did not anticipate the interconnected nature of today's threats or range of cooperation that would exist between them, meaning that economic issues, security issues, health issues, gender issues, and climate stuff are all very much interrelated. And on top of it, it's the fact that we have to do things on all these pressing global problems is enhanced by the fact that we have more and more knowledge about it. We have to, to realize that we are coming from a world where the amount of knowledge of the global effects of what we are doing was quite limited. Okay, we do have, and it's debatable of course, and a bit of scientific knowledge is debatable, but we have quite a lot of more insights in the global effects of what we the second uh, quote is from Helen Clark, uh, from New Zealand. Helen Clark is the top administrator of UNDP, the development program of the UN. Um, and there she said, in October 2013, UNDP believes that regional integration can be a powerful source of inclusive and sustainable growth. So within the UN, you see the top people are uh, uh, talking in that direction, and this means, once again, that there is this window of opportunity. But also outside of the UN, Here's Hillary Clinton, 
October 2011 in the Foreign Policy magazine, we, the US, are seeking to shape and participate in a responsive, flexible, and effective regional architecture. Really? This is fantastic because this is something totally different as what has been the US policy for many years now. So, and then, um, I don't know if you recognize this person, but I just wanted to show you that even the Australians are on the same wavelength. So, in November 2013, a member of parliament, Kevin Rudd, at the World Economic Forum in Davos said, with legacy institutions of global governments typically incapable of achieving more than least common denominator solutions, and with the capacity of nation states to tackle global uh, issues also limited, this is the Australian way of putting things as they are. No, it's and the right way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the end, there is an enormous potential for regional institutions to fill some of these gaps. But hence, we are saying there is indeed way that we should make more rooms for regions within the UN factory and that we should go back to the initial church dreams. I will end by saying what could be the elements of such a multi-level regionalism in my personal view. I have no UN mandate to say what I want to do this, but it's my personal views as an academic. We should first of all not see the regional level as something that goes against the global level. And I think we have to stay working within the framework of the UN, who has, I would say, the primary responsibility of maintaining peace and security. And it's only within that framework that regional organizations and states can and should act and take responsibilities for peace and security uh, missions. It also means, in my view, and this is again a social science fiction, really, uh, that we should have a reform of the Security Council and make it a hybrid forum where you have some permanent, non permanent states on the one hand and perhaps permanent or non permanent regional organizations on the other hand. Again, this is, seems unthinkable today, but my guess is that in the future it will be on the agenda. We should go further with observe status and go so forth to grant regional organizations membership of the UN, as is always already the case in other UN organizations. We should rethink the role of the regional economic commissions within the UN and make them more in tune with the external regional uh, institutions. And also, I think, because the regional integration processes are so unevenly divided, also in terms of resources worldwide, especially in African countries, uh, there should be a kind of funds for UN support to support uh, or to assist the development of regional integration processes in developing countries. And last but not least, what we then need is to think of a architecture, a new architecture that brings together the global and regional security uh, mechanisms. Um, right, so for now, this was in a nutshell, and without being technical, I hope, my vision on what can be the future of global governance and regional governance, starting from perhaps indeed not a scientific premise, but from an ideological premise that I believe in that governance should not be seen as something that is a competition between different levels, but it should be seen as something that has to be done at all possible levels, meaning states, and by the way, not only the states as unitary blocks themselves, but if you have a federalized state, also the, the, the subnational regions, and this opens up a whole new debate, which is also fascinating from a UN perspective, because as I said, the UN works now with the issue that the member states are the primary building blocks and the members. But what we see is increasingly a number of governance issues have been devolved from state level to subnational level. So why should we not have the subnational region levels also involved? And actually, this is already happening. If you go, for instance, to UNESCO uh, in some countries, Canada, for instance, in Canada, Quebec has its own delegation to UNESCO. In Belgium, we have the Flemish delegation, we have the European delegation. And why is this so well? Because the, the topics of, of <coughs> UNESCO, cultural education, are no longer dealt with at the Belgian federal level, but they are dealt with at the Belgian uh, subnational level. So also there, I think, that for that kind of regions, which are of a different nature as a regional supranational organization, the UN should open its, uh, its doors. And then, once you have the system of 
not the level of confidence when you take into account that indeed you should work with all the possible levels together. It's a question on the one hand of saying this is best done at that level, subsidiarity principle, but there should also be, and I will end with this, another uh, normative principle that should play, which I call the mutuality principle, it's played for the federalist literature, which means that every level should think about its own policies in terms of what can we do at our level, micro, national, macro, what can we do at our level to make the effectiveness of the other policy levels as big as possible? What can we, what can we do to strengthen the other policy levels? And that's a totally new way of thinking rather than saying, this is my competence, you should not deal with it, as we have seen so many times in Belgium, and uh, but we should think in other terms and say, okay, what can we do for this is not the message. Thank you very much.